and that's the intent is that um, and the intent is to tie it up and that there's germplasm meat germplasm is breeding material just seed varieties that are being used for breeding and research purposes that he wouldn't touch as a breeder because companies could assert their rights under a patent. So I touched on a couple of the consequences, just a few more. Um, you know, over the last 20 years, we have lost over 200 seed com independent seed companies. I think the number is much higher since I last looked. So these are companies that have either been acquired or just couldn't compete with the, with the larger companies. Um, these independent seed companies, you know, were that they were in the best position to serve the, need, the diverse and regional needs of farmers in their region. And so losing more independent players means that we have less diversity available, less responsiveness to the different needs of farmers, regardless of their scale, crop type, and region where they're growing. I already mentioned in Joe's slides about how prices have dramatically increased along with consolidation in the market, and I mentioned the role that patents have played too in restricting access to seed, restricting research, and to um, restricting a farmer's time-honored right to save seed. One important um, element of this conversation is that the dominant firms have no genuine interest in the success of truly sustainable agriculture. So their products, chemicals especially, but also seed, are designed for chemical intensive agriculture. They're not designed to serve the needs of organic growers, of growers who adhere to agroecological practices, to growers who don't want to use expensive synthetic chemical inputs. And, and they that, are chemical companies. Yeah. They are largely chemical companies. That's, that's, yeah, that's an important point to point out about that graph is, first and foremost, these companies were chemical companies before they entered the life sciences, before they entered the seed market. And then public breeding programs, which historically have been responsive to the needs of growers, especially in their region. Unfortunately, we've seen those programs dramatically decrease in terms of funding. We've lost 33% of our public plant breeding programs over the last 20 years alone. And in important ways, those breeding programs are filling in for gaps that the private sector isn't filling. The private sector is doing some things well, be it a small seed company, medium-sized seed company, large seed company, but there are some crops that just aren't lucrative for seed companies to focus on in terms of research and development or for seed production. And that's where public breeding programs come in. They're responsive to those needs, regardless of whether it makes money, because they're not in the business. They shouldn't be in the business of making money. They're in the business of providing regionally adapted uh, crop varieties that are constantly meeting the changing needs of growers in the, across the United States. All right, so here's the fun part. Um, I'm just checking in with the time. So, to grow the resistance, if, if um, thinking about, and this is part of the conversation I know today, especially this morning, with supporting a community food system, a regional food system, the foundation of a healthy food system is a healthy seed system. A seed system that's going to be responding to the needs, especially of local growers and eaters and the markets they're serving. For a farmer to be successful, I'm stating the obvious, you know, farmers need seeds that are optimal for their, their production practices, for their environmental conditions, for their regional climate, which is always changing. So we need access to seed that allows growers to adapt to those changing climates, that allows growers to keep ownership and control over their seed supply. But seed systems are complicated. And it takes, a, it takes a comprehensive strategy and um, diverse partnerships to truly support the growth of a regional seed system in order to strengthen a re regional food system work. So here in Montana, there are a number of groups and businesses fostering these type of collaborations in the areas of research, education, policy advocacy, and also enterprise development. And so, Going on here in Montana, and I'm gonna lean on you all too to help me fill in some of these gaps with the storytelling. Um, but over the last several years, um, 
I myself have witnessed an increase in both investment, attention, and participation in research that is helping farmers and gardeners alike understand which varieties perform well in their, in their region, in their microclimate, on their specific farm or in their specific garden. And so there are a number of variety trials going on among growers, including here in, the, in Western Montana. And that information, that data that is collected from those trials is then shared with other growers openly. That's another consequence of consolidation. A lot of the performance data of how varieties um, perform is, is no longer being made public, in part because sometimes companies don't allow their varieties to be a part of a variety trial, to see how their variety uh, performs against or competes with, say, a variety from the Good Seed Company or from even one of the major competitors. And so that, that research is important. Um, also promising in the state, I'm going to kind of zoom out to statewide and then come back to the region as I can. Um, but for the first time, um, I've been in Montana 15 years, and it's only been within the last few years that there's a genuine interest from our own land grant university in responding to the needs of sustainable agriculture here in the state. And so some partnerships there are growing as well that I think will support regional and community seed system work, especially when it comes to um, developing varieties that are adapted to our various regional climates across the state um, and that are adapted to the environment of their intended use in sustainable ag systems. There are a number of um, collaborations to host educational events to give both gardeners and farmers alike the skills they need to save seed or grow seed on their farm so that they aren't as reliant on the dominant players for their seed supply. And then to share that seed either locally with other farmers through a seed library or to even sell those varieties through other seed catalogs so that other farmers can benefit from the diversity that they're generating on their own farm. This event, Free the Seeds, the initiative, the organization, is probably the best example of the mo momentum that is growing to provide education, to provide a forum for networking and sharing. Because one of the values that we need to instill in a regional seed system is the value of fairness and open access, shared benefit. Um, to ensure that the seed, again, is remaining in the public domain, in the community's domain. There have been, um, I, going down here to new businesses, whether it's smaller seed companies emerging, I know the Good Seed Company has been around longer than just operating here in Montana, but the Triple Divide Organic Seed Co-op, how many people have seen their seed? Their mission is to develop regionally adapted seed for Montana gardeners. <coughs> and farmers, and they've only come on the scene um, over the last six, seven years or so, selling packeted seed. So these businesses are filling in important gaps um, for, again, regionally appropriate seed for the state. Colleges and schools are getting involved. Here at the college, um, Heather Estrada, who is the director of their ag program, has started to conduct variety trials. Remember me mentioning that before, to provide some good information about which varieties are performing well and eventually wants to get into some plant breeding projects so that we can be selecting for and adapting um, varieties that are most suitable to the Flathead Valley in particular. They're doing a bean trial, right? Or that's yeah, they've, they've um, applied for funding for a dry bean trial. Um, and one of the reasons why that project is important, especially, and I hope it gets funded, I think it will, is because when Heather went to look for information that would help her make good bean seed choices, there wasn't any. She didn't, she just had to guess and try for herself which bean variety performed well, not just in Montana or in the Intermountain West, but here at the college's um, farm. And so it's exciting to see some of those institutions getting more involved. Where I live in Missoula, one of our local nonprofits, Garden City Harvest, which manages, I don't know how many community gardens at this point, but also runs two local farms that provides produce to the food bank um, and provides educational opportunities for University of Montana students. Um, they now have seed projects incorporated into all of their farming projects. Um, a lot of their crops are actually grown from saved seed and they're also saving that seed and then sh sharing those packets of seed freely with their community garden um, members. And so I think there's some really good examples that other communities across the state can build off of. Another cool example is that a, re a restaurant recently showcased something on their menu 
in Missoula, again, where I live, that was grown from locally produced seed. And they educated their customers there at the restaurant about that story. And so there's been so much momentum over the years of, around local food systems and understanding who your farmer is, where your food came from. And I feel like we're now entering into this really exciting time that is helping people ask the question about where did their seed come from? What, what seed grew the food on my plate? And why is that important? Um, and so that momentum is, is very exciting. Um, the few principles that need to under, that need to serve as the foundation of all these initiatives in my mind are diversity, principle of health, both for the planet and people, and then of course fairness. And I think if we adhere to these principles, and are building a local seed system um, collaboratively, I think that it will result in more resilience because that's what we really need to establish, especially with climate chaos and other challenges, including a highly consolidated seed industry. Our vision at Organic Seed Alliance is to support seed systems that are democratic and just, that support the health of the planet and people alike, and that in the end deliver genetically diverse and regionally adapted <coughs> seed to farmers wherever they live. I want to just highlight before we open it up for conversation, just some seed champions in your neck of the woods. Um, Judy Alsawitz from Terrapin Farms has been growing seed, actually mostly since 2003 when Seminus was acquired by Monsanto. When Seminus was acquired by Monsanto, because so many small and medium-sized organic growers used Seminus varieties, they have really good varieties, high quality varieties. Um, they were placed in this ethical quandary. Do we keep sourcing seed that performs really well on our farms, but support now this ag biotech giant, which is in conflict with our own personal ethic and principles? Or do we scramble to find alternatives? And in Judy's case, she dropped all the seminist varieties that she relied on. That, made up, that represented about 20% of her varieties, and she grows hundreds of varieties of vegetables. And it empowered her to start saving some of her own seed. And to this day, she's not only saving dozens and dozens of kinds of uh, types of seed, but she's also doing some of her own plant breeding. She's doing selections every year to adapt those varieties to her needs here in the northwest corner of Montana. She's also selling seed to a number of companies across the country. So again, other farmers can benefit from her work as a seed grower. And then she is a co-founder of the Triple Divide Seed Co-op that I mentioned earlier. Robin. There's Robin and the Good Seed Company. <laughs> Another great example of a local enterprise that is responding to the crisis of seed industry consolidation, but empowering more people to think local and to support regional seed system development. One important element here is that in scrambling to find alternatives or in being empowered to do your own seed saving and seed growing, you're probably going to end up in the years ahead with varieties that are much better than the ones that you lost access to. Mm -hmm. And so that's a really positive element here because seed as a living organism embodies endless potential. And I find that incredibly hopeful. Um, Carl Sutton is in Polson, who's another co-founder of Triple Divides Organic Seed. He's gotten the seed bug to the point where I think most of his production now has transitioned from produce to organic seed production, um, selling through the Triple Divide Organic Seed Label, but also to companies around the country. This is a picture of him hosting a workshop for my research team at Organic Seed Alliance um, to showcase some of his seed production. Doug Beatty is in Dixon, Montana. He's been a wonderful partner in growing some organic sweet corn varieties and the reason why people are contracting him to grow organic sweet corn varieties in Dixon, Montana is because he's secluded from genetically engineered corn that could cross-pollinate and contaminate these varieties. Um, for years he grew, um, gosh, I don't know how many pounds of a sweet corn called Who Gets Kissed. It was developed by my team and some researchers at University of Wisconsin-Madison as well as organic farmers and it's um, one of the first commercially available organically bred sweet corns that it tastes amazing and I have some with me if anybody wants to try some um, but we're now some farmers in Western Montana are now using uh, those that variety and adapting it to Northwestern Montana conditions 
I think they might call it a quick kiss because it's going to be super short. <laughs> but um, Doug has been growing seed for years and um, is grows really high quality seed. And then lastly, Leslie Klein, another co-founder of Triple Divide Organic Seed. She largely manages a lot of the operations. This is a picture in Moise um, hosting another uh, workshop for Organic Seed Alliance showcasing varieties of onions to understand storability traits, um, other production traits for onion growers in Montana. Now, I've talked a lot about farmers' roles as seed stewards, but I don't know how many, how many people in here are farmers? Do we have any farmers? Do we have gardeners? So our work as, I'm a gardener too, as seed savers, as gardeners, is as impactful in supporting the alternative to our highly consolidated seed industry. We are generating our own diversity in our backyards, and believe it or not, that diversity has global importance. This is kale seed I grew, and if I can do it, I guarantee that anyone <laughs> in this room can do it. But um, there are a number of resources on the sheet provided to you. I wanted to point to a couple others. If you get the seed bug and want to dive deep into seed saving, especially crop by crop, this is a great resource that is relatively new. Uh, as well as we have a free seed saving guide, both for gardeners and farmers on our website that walks you through uh, best practices. Again, the handout you have has other resources, um, including I want to give a shout out to the regional partners here in the Flathead Valley. Um, and I mentioned some of the initiatives already, including the Flathead Valley Community Colleges work on their agricultural farm and companies in the seed library as well, which is most, is in Columbia Falls or Whitefish too? Columbia Falls. Columbia Falls, okay. Is there anything else either of you want to say about the library or other initiatives that I'm forgetting? Um, so that we're, well, there's starting to be um, just more and more interest in seed saving and mm -hmm. more workshops becoming available through um, endeavors that are focused on sustainability at the community level. Yeah. So we have a couple of community adult education organizations that are interested in this stuff. That's great. Yeah. And isn't there a carrot project that you want? Am I jumping ahead? Um, was there a carrot variety trial project that you mentioned? Oh, carrots. Carrots. I, think I thought you said care too. Oh, sorry. No, no, my mouth is dry. Um, do you need to? Um, I don't know about a carrot variety trial. Well, I'm doing I'm I'm doing a variety trial with Todd and Lucio to okay. farm for their carrots. That's my yeah. About. Okay. Yeah. So we've uh, we've saved the seed and he has to grow it. It's into his hands to grow it out this spring. Okay. And see how it does. Okay. Yeah. And then yeah. if that works well, then it's be good. Yeah. And there's another um, local seed carrots. Where's Native Ideals? Oh, I forget. Oh, yes, native, they're fabulous. Native, uh, yeah, they're yeah. in Arlie. In Arlie, yeah. and they do native, native flowers, native plants, wildflowers, yeah. Yeah. pollinators. Yeah. 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 Which is on the sheet, too. But I just think that, you know, just to highlight what you already said, Kiki, I mean, I think when we think about food systems, it's easy to forget the seed part of it because mm -hmm. it's not, you know, it's it's the small part yeah. that I think a lot of people don't think about, and it's it's the foundation. It's the most important part of the food system because without good seed, we won't have food at all. Um, it's where it starts, and I think it kind of gets pushed aside a little too often. And so it's yeah. important that we learn about where it's been, where it's going, and where it's at. And, and yeah, go ahead. Well, just so in addition to all of this, which is about just basic access, there's also it's turning out as we do as we you know we the global we do the science that uh, it makes a difference in how the seed is grown, yeah. the quality of the seed yes. that gets produced, and the nutrient density capacity <laughs> of that seed. You know the, the epigenetics and the all of that stuff and the yeah. relationship with the soil microbes and all that stuff. Absolutely. So it's a whole other level that's not being looked at at all. And there's a stat in Europe, in the Netherlands, there's a woman named Edith Van Buren. Um, Edith Lambert Van Buren. 
she was one of the first like organic plant breeders and she talks about that as a systems approach it's not just about the plant but you're right about the relationship with the microbe systems and um fortunately there's emerging science in that regard here in the states as well as you probably know but it is an important factor and again like see like plant variety you know your um chioga beet or whatever variety you're planting it's never finished it's never the same and that i find that really inspiring and empowering because those plant genetics contain, as I said before, endless potential to dictate the quality of our food, be it the flavor, the nutritional content, um, the success we have within our garden. Does it have some good disease resistance or even pest resistance? Um, is, it, is it going to yield well? Is it slow to bolt in our high, um, in our, in our high heat summers at times? So the, the potential is endless if we can take the time to steward it. And even if you don't have time to save seed, there, there are so many ways you can support a regional seed system. Learning more about who grows your seed and the seed supplier you buy from. Asking questions. Is there, is there an intellectual property right associated with it? Is there a patent associated with it? How was it grown? Was it grown locally? By whom? Or was it grown you know, overseas? Which on its own isn't a bad thing. I think it's good to try seed from everywhere to see how it performs, but if your value is to support locally grown seed, ask those questions and support companies that align with your values. Um, but if you are interested in saving seed, do it, because it is a, a, a part of the resistance. We can grow the resistance starting with seed, and that is one of the best ways that we can take back seed while generating more diversity along the way, which again, I find incredibly hopeful. We've lost a lot of genetic diversity, but what we forget is with this movement, which is in important ways a grassroots movement, we are generating new diversity. And not just saving heirlooms, but, but creating the heirlooms of tomorrow um, to ensure that we have access to seed that does well and that future generations have access to that seed uh, as well. Again, some of these um, ideas are on the sheet before you. Um, if you want to get involved in some of this work, including the policy advocacy part, which I haven't talked about, that's what I do for Organic Seed Alliance. I'm often going to Washington, D.C. to testify on the importance of seed being in the public domain, of more regulations for genetically engineered crops, for research that supports sustainable agriculture more broadly, and there are always opportunities, including here at the state level, oftentimes policy opportunities. So check out our website at seedalliance.org, and you can, um, you can choose when you sign up for our quarterly newsletter to receive policy action updates as well, if that's of interest to you. So at the local level, are there any initiatives we should be you know, voting for? Is there some activism that's already kind of place that we can pay attention to here? Yeah, good question. Um, in the current legislature, there isn't a bill moving forward that I'm aware of that uh, relates to the topics that we talked about today, um, which is why you know, we, it's important to show up for those policy initiatives when they're available and when we need to speak up um, for one position or the other. Meanwhile, we have so much power to affect change and to grow this resistance, as I just mentioned. So another thing I find important is that we don't have to wait for a change in Washington, D.C. for some of, for the future that we want. We can just, we can start creating it now. Um, but to answer your question directly, you know, there's nothing right now, unless there's something even more local that I'm not aware of. I mean, the biggest initiative that's happening that's not political, but is this event, you know? When we talk about like what can you do, you can grow seed for free seeds. Because down there we packaged um, in the last three months over 10,000 packets of seed, and most of it is um, the packaged seed that we did is a lot of local seed. I mean, it's pretty amazing. That's awesome. And 10,000 packets is a lot, and we had tons of different groups um, coming to you know package it there was different school groups there was um, Robin hosts a seed packing parties at the um, community library or the Columbia Falls um, community seed library um, you know so it, it just even participating in those pieces is, it will get you in in the in the know about what's going on regarding the 
Another thing you can do if you shop at the farmer's market is ask farmers you're buying food from where they get their seed from and what informs their seed decisions. And it's going to make them aware that their customers are thinking about seed and that if they're not already thinking more deeply about it um, and considering questions that they might not be asking their seed supplier, it'll, it'll spur those conversations um, and actions on their end as well. I think that point that Kiki just made is huge. Because what we've been talking about in Robin Ed and whatever you want, because you speak of this so well, but when we think about the food system and this whole this whole day is about the fact that we are all a part of the food system, right? If you eat, you're in, you know, food is important. We that's the only way we survive. And all these efforts to think about change that we'd like to happen, when we think about the fact that if, if you just identify with the consumer part of the food system, I think oftentimes you don't think about that you're really a part of it, and you are, and so therefore being willing to do something to help in general for, um, you know, if, if sustainability is important to you, or if packaging is important to you, or if, you know, Kalispell Creamery, now we don't recycle plastic in this valley, just ridiculous you know they are looking to go towards glass but it's a super expensive idea so they need community help to make that happen it's like realizing that if you have if you value these things then you actually can you, you do have a voice and the more you exercise your voice the more that change is going to happen which is kind of a which is an empowering thing to think about so mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think another in, in this question of you know what what can we do and where are we? It's, there's a piece about I, I keep losing this, but there's a piece about um, making it how to support making it economically viable mm. to be uh, a community-based seed source. Yes, and I'm not I don't know the answer to that question, but what would be supportive in figuring that? Yes, that's a great question. Um, I'm going to start in a slightly different place, Robin, sure. because I don't think resources exist, as you just described, at a community level. Sure. But we, Organic Seed Alliance, we've been around for 15 years. We host a national conference for organic seed growers. And when I say organic, a lot of these growers have farms that are certified under the USDA organic program, but a lot of these farmers aren't certified organic, but use organic practices. So the community is much bigger than just certified organic. And what we hear time and time again at that conference and through educational events we host is that farmers want resources that help them understand the economics of seed production so they know if it's viable for them to integrate seed into their diversified farm operation. So they know which crops you know, yield what and what prices they might expect for that seed. Like, it's a lot of risk to go into seed, not the least of which is it takes a whole different skill set from just growing in vegetables, for example, produce, and then growing those, with those crops for, for as a seed crop. So um, for what it's worth, um, Organic Seed Alliance has developed a number of tools. We're actually in the middle of a project that it has created enterprise budgeting tools for seed growers to track the expenses associated with growing their seed crops. And we're using five test farms here in Western Montana, actually, to, and we're working with an agriculture economist, too, who understands sustainable agriculture really well, um, to develop those tools, collect data, and then put out a resource that describes how to use this enterprise budgeting tool and, and also like lessons learned, like what did we learn through these five case studies using these tools. The project will also include information collected from seed companies serving sustainable ag agriculture, growers who are using sustainable practices, serving those seed companies to understand the prices they pay for crops. This is for, so this is, this, this is relevant to a local system yeah. in that economically, even though these seed companies might exist in another state, again, like understanding the, the price they might get for different crops, as well as what those crops generally yield. Of course, that'll change by region and state. Um, so this information is very much needed and desired by seed growers, and I believe next year we will have that resource available. And maybe from there, Robin, there's a conversation to be had about taking that to the next level of like how that fits into a system mm -hmm. economically. 
Also, I believe um, there will be a resource within the next couple of years that provides lessons learned and best practices of seed cooperatives around the country because so many growers uh, are interested in that type of model. Unfortunately, some seed co-ops haven't been successful, and so we want to learn why. Yeah. Of course, it's not going to be one size fits all in terms of models, but we want to understand why. Um, and this is a project that we're not leading, but we're a partner in. Um, it's happening here in Montana, and so I'll keep you abreast of that as well. It'll be some good. That that's much more group systems thinking in terms of economics yeah. and lessons learned. I have another thought. I'll just keep asking if that's okay. <laughs> um, so another tension is, uh, you know, market farmers, to, to some degree, you know, they're driven by consumer want, uh, desires or whatever, and some of that's driven by uh, hybrid products. And so the tension between, you know, the market farmer trying to provide the product that the consumer thinks he or she wants, yeah. and that's really only provided so far by the hybrid seed. Like, how, how working with that dynamic? Yeah. I think that comes down to if growers want more access to open pollinated varieties of a certain crop, say sweet corn that's regionally adapted, or um, I don't know what another good, maybe broccoli, um, then, I mean, that is, uh, again, like a research opportunity, an education opportunity in the way of um, researching alternatives that are open pollinated, maybe doing variety trials in your region or uh, community to identify which varieties uh, perform well there are open pollinated and can be approved upon because you can save that seed. And of course, you're gonna have more control. I mean, some growers just really like the uniformity of hybrids, so they're gonna keep growing them. But for those growers who want want to improve upon those varieties, save that seed. And maybe I'm saying the obvious for you. Yeah, but no, I'm just curious. Yeah. It's, I'm just curious. It's, a, it, it's, just a, it, it's just a tension that, you know, it, to me it's, I, so I guess I think about it in terms of like, if the person that he's educating is the consumer in my opinion, yeah. but I don't even know how to start that conversation. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But. I mean, yeah, and consumers in some cases are really used to a, a vegetable looking a certain way, tasting a certain way, appearing a certain way. And so, you know, there's been some movement in terms of like colored carrots or other genetic diversity being injected into even the conventional food system. Um, but I think involving communities in yeah. some of that research and showcasing new varieties, like for example, when we do variety trials, we invite, we, we do an event, like come taste our varieties, and then we have paper on our picnic tables, and people are like choosing, putting stars next to the variety they like best, and saying, oh, this one's too bitter, you know, this one's sweet. And that information is used by plant breeders. It informs plant breeding decisions. Oh, well, maybe we'll cross these varieties, or we'll move this variety forward, but not this one, because people just did not like how it tastes. And if people don't like how it tastes, it might have the best disease resistance in the world. It's, that's not going to support a grower's success, right? So it's a more participatory approach to, to seed system work. It's also, of course, an educational opportunity to tell yeah. them why that's important. Well, it's also you know part of that food cycle, just that educational, you know, just all informs itself. Yeah. But I think that idea, Robin, is kind of interesting. Of like maybe. Free the Seeds needs to host a, you know, a, you know, maybe we work on getting, you know, a certain amount of farmers to, to grow certain crops and start doing taste tests in the summertime. You know, maybe that's another thing we could. You could do care testings here in March. I mean, those at store yeah. Yeah. Um So absolutely. Well, that's an interesting idea. Yeah. Carrots are really easy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was buying two pairs of carrots until. February for the backpack program was pretty exciting. We're talking about community uh, tastings, variety tastings, uh -huh. to inform seed growing decisions and sometimes plant breeding. Triple divide could really help with that. Triple divide is done by that. Have you done any project forms with me? Yeah, they do evaluations. So you've had evaluations at field days. 
Um, at MOA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And we did um, some restaurants. We had some restaurants do it for us. Cool. And then um, I made my interns eat cucumbers five days a week. And give me different descriptions. Well, you guys, a little more words here. <laughs> well, what's neat are there are more resources to support these efforts. So um, I mentioned the University of Wisconsin and Madison a lot because they're just way ahead in terms of land grants focusing on organic plant breeding and participatory research and seed system work. There's a cool uh, collaborative called Seed to Kitchen. And the, the researcher there, Dr. Uh, Julie Dawson, who's a brilliant, humble human being, I can't praise her enough, she's developed this collaborative. And she not only takes it to the level of like culinary traits and testing for nutritional quality, but she's also designed evaluation forms and guidance for Free the Seeds could use these to help you understand how to get um, quality and reliable data from a taste test. Not that you need to be like uber scientific about it, but there is a, there's a growing scientist, science, excuse me, around mm -hmm. that. And it's neat to see it coming down to the community level. So remind me to follow up with you about that if it's of interest. Sure. Yeah. We're, we have a tomato breeding project focused on organic systems, working with researchers in North Carolina, Washington State, Wisconsin, Purdue. And what's cool about that is just to underscore the, the um, efficiency and effectiveness of participatory models, whether it's one region or across the country, there's a lot of disease pressure for tomatoes in the Carolinas. So, we could, so the variety trials of different tomato varieties are conducted there. And then the selections are done based on which ones survive that, those diseases best. And then the seed is sent to my team in Washington State to be grown out for seed to, um, uh, the growers will increase the quantity of that seed, again, to keep using it research purposes. And one of the goals, so again, we're leveraging regions to help identify those important production traits and then doing tastings across the country and then making certain crosses, just using traditional breeding methods, we're not talking about genetic engineering, just crosses with heirlooms and more modern varieties so that we have that good flavor and texture from heirloom varieties, but they're combined with some of the production traits that we've made more progress in some of the modern varieties with. And so we're trying to like give growers and consumers the full package there. Also, the last benefit, one of additional benefit to these partnerships is that then our partners in these different states can grow up that seed and do their own selection so they're regionally adapted you know, with that package of flavor, disease resistance, nutrition quality. It's very cool. Yeah. Awesome. Other questions or brainstorms? Are there reasons why some of you in the room might not want to save seed or feel like it's kind of daunting? Questions you have? Maybe you haven't thought about saving seed, but really want to now. Never thought it at all. Yeah, yeah. I never yeah. thought where it all begins. You know, mm -hmm. my stepmom she gardens like her sons off, and I'm gonna go home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can think of it as the first critical link in the food production chain. I'll yeah. just say that I have a small vegetable farm, and the thought of saving seed scares me to death. <laughs> I'm like. I don't know, that's what my like, community does, it's like other people do, not me. Yeah. But then last year, Robin told me I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> so we started in little bits. And so it is, uh, and having people, resources in the community mm -hmm. that can teach you how to do it, like take away the scariness, because I'm like, I don't know. Like, what do you have to do with the tomatoes? And then you're like, it's not that hard. And I'm like, are you sure about that? Like just learning. It's a different knowledge base. It's a different knowledge base. And as yeah. a farmer, I was like, I mean, Yes, I can keep my dill seed and my <laughs> cilantro seed, but yes. you know, but to take it up to the next level and like, so it's just knowing how, like, what things cross pollinate. Like, yes. how do I, how do I keep my zucchini if I want to keep? What do, what do I have to do? So it was, it's, it's still, I'm still like, this scary to me. Like, yeah, I don't know. I think crop by crop. Yeah. Um, can I just, if you don't mind me putting yeah. you on the spot as you a can. farmer in the Go room, <laughs> have, what? 
what changes have you witnessed as a grower over the years in terms of have you lost access to a variety that you really liked that did especially well in your specific yes. region? That has happened. Yeah. Um, particularly some type of plants that I really like. Yeah, then all of a sudden one year you just think you're going to have them and then they're not there. Mm -hmm. And you know, you took years to find like say a jalapeno plant that was what that we felt just did well for us and was consistent in flavor, you know, not like every tenth one had heat and yeah. you're like, well, are these really jalapenos? And then finding that variety and not taking care of my own seed and then it's not available anymore. Yeah. And it just says seed's not available and when you see that in the catalog, you're like, hmm, it took me five years to find that variety. Yeah. Now what? Yeah. It makes you feel pretty vulnerable <laughs> yeah. to the shifts. Yeah. yeah. We're peppers that started me from my seed. Pardon me? That's what started me on the seed. Oh, really? Was it was the cargo pepper. Oh, okay. We lost that in the leaves. And you were able to keep the seed now? I mean, I revived it. You revived yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. I reselected it, and it took me 20 years to get it consistent. And that's yes. a lifetime of one. It is one little pepper. <laughs> <Right. laughs> <Right. laughs> oh, yeah, but you're like, oh, no, what am I going to do? Like, I don't have it anymore. Yeah, I yeah. found out while well, I still had some peppers in the field and no seed in, in my stock room, so I saved seed from that year. Right. But it was changing because it was new sweet pepper, so I had to go through a deselection process. Right. Yeah. That's all, yeah. Tainted is mine. It was crossed. It was crossed. So it lost <laughs> some of its variety and integrity. It did, but I got it back. Judy, I told this story earlier about how you were placed in an ethical quandary when Seminus was acquired in 2003 by Monsanto and decided to abandon about 20% of the varieties you were growing. Mm -hmm. And it's one reason why you were empowered to become a seed grower mm -hmm. and now plant breeder, I would say. Farmer breeder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How many, how many um, different varieties are you growing for seed? I think it's up to 60. Wow. 60? That's mm -hmm. incredible. But some of them are really small quantities, you know. Still. But um, it's it's daunting sometimes. It's daunting in the living room and the dining room. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen pictures. That's where it's daunting. Do you have ideas on how to take grower seed work like yours to the next level to be more embedded in a a regional seed system? beyond, you know, the triple divide packets? Mm -hmm. Is there a way, are there models that could be explored? Hmm. I haven't seen any models that are, well, that's not true. I think um, what's, you know, that, um, Eva's aunt and uncle. Oh, I don't know, but I know we Turtle tree. Oh! Really? Yeah. That's your aunt and uncle? No. Did not know that. Yeah, they did that to you. So maybe that or you. No. But it, 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 their seed work is part of, oh, sorry. It's part of a community yes. system. Yes. <laughs> sorry. It's part of a community system that um, involves. Um, it yeah. is a different model in that and regard. They just have this, I don't know them, I've never been there, but I've read all their stuff and I've seen the pictures and you just look at the pictures and you just see joy, yeah. you know, because it's, they're doing something they love. Isn't that biodynamic? Yes, they're yeah. also biodynamic. That's Kimberly just, Hills, I think yeah. it's Kimberton or, I forgot what Yeah. Is. But that was turtle tree seeds, and now they're all to a hearth, meadow hearth, I think. They left the community back to did in the constant pandemic, and they know that the seed has not been really with the community for probably 25 years, I think. And, and that, that's about the only example I can really think of. You know, I think um, some of the plant communities are, um, are you know, the hammock community in Virginia, what's it called? Twin Oaks. Oh, Commonwealth? Twin Oaks. Yep, and that's a and then, Commonwealth seed co um, is what's his name? Edmund Frost. Yes, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. incredible. Yes, and they they they've taken seeds also yeah. into the community in a really big way and made it a part of their community yes. the production of seeds. And um, but that's a dedicated community, 
And we're talking about a very loose-knit group of people with some common interests. We have a goal of 25% of locally grown produce starts with locally grown seed, and just like have a little campaign about it, and then maybe they can advertise that at the farmer's market because it adds value to their, their product. They're part of this local movement. So I think smaller initiatives like that, which do take effort, but I think Free the Seeds is well positioned to lead, is, is one way to do it. It's providing education, but you're also getting more food grown from local seeds. The, the most profound example I've seen is in Cuba, mm -hmm. where they buy no seed. They, they grow one lettuce, one tomato, yeah. you know, one, uh, and, and they, they have the very tidy raised beds and there'll be like all these lettuces in a row, and then there'll be one head of lettuce that happened to grow sticking out to the side. And those are the ones they save the seeds from because those are the stalwart, tough guys that are going to make it. Huh. And they're also isolated, they have more space if they're doing that, you know, so that they can develop a, a part of the seed that way. But they don't, because they don't have transportation or funds or money down there, they, they have very little that goes from one town to the next, even. And so their seeds are pretty much very regional. Yeah. All of this education it feels like it's just a series of three foot tosses, you know. It's not any one thing, it's a combination of everything. And I you know, when you I hear you talk to you about communities where seed saving is that's they, they don't have seeds they don't eat, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's the bottom line. So in that space there's no con there's really less issue about, gosh, can I do this? I don't know how many choice I have to do it. Um, but we're at a point where, you know, We've just sort of gotten so pulled back from that relationship that we used to have that we start to query our capacity or our, or our capability of of, this, of being some good seed savers. Or, or it just reminds me of thinking, you know, I watch this with myself. Um, it, it's like, you know, this medicine that comes in a bottle is better than the herbal medicine that I get from my garden. Like I somehow I find myself questioning that when the reality is is that's just as good, but it's. It's, it's just it's a mind reconfiguration. It's easier to go buy seeds than to grow them. It's yes. easier to go buy the medicine than to get it from the garden. Yeah. It's just, it's, we're just so convenient and so package oriented and we want to see the picture and the label too, you know? Well, pick your own picture, right? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you guys have heard me talk though that one of my mantras is I feel like it is the responsibility yeah. of every grower to maintain and improve a couple of seeds. It's not everything. Let's get the exchange. Let's do the free the seeds. Let's have our seed exchange. But it's your responsibility if you're a grower to see to it that you're maintaining and improving a couple of times for your system. Who's growing the seed? How is it produced? Is there an intellectual property restriction associated with it? Like, you know, taking and then that education aspect. If you're not going to grow your own seed, like, and encourage people to ask those questions. Have you brought up OSSI at all? Oh no, I haven't. Yeah, so the open source seed initiative is, uh, how much time, no, I can do this quickly. <laughs> it's, a, it's an initiative that was started by a group of breeders, farmer breeders, independent seed companies, um, research organizations like Organic Seed Alliance. And for a few years, we, um, I was on the planning committee for a while, the goal was to find a legally defensible um, license that was truly, that truly provided, that truly protected seed in an open source way. So trying to take the shrink wrap open source model, excuse me, open source software model, and apply that to seed. Well, not surprising, seed is very different from software. <laughs> and it turned, we had a pro bono attorney helping for a while, and it unfortunately turned out to be impossible to have this license be viral. With all the progeny of that seed, and furthermore, a lot of growers were turned off by this idea of having this like very lengthy license that described open source usage, open source principles. Um, and so that effort unfortunately had to be abandoned, but it was very instructive. And so now OSSI, again, the Open Source Seed Initiative, was launched as a nonprofit, largely as a communications platform to talk about the problems utility patents pose to um, growers' rights to a healthy seed system. and. Um, some farmers and breeders are putting in the Aussie pledge on their packets and basically it says by using the seed you agree to share it and not allow any restrictions on it. 
uh, things like that. So again, because it's a pledge, it's serving more as an education and communications opportunity. Um, and But it's gotten a ton of interest. I mean, dozens and dozens of growers and breeders across the world yeah. um, using the Aussie Seed Pledge. Um, we certainly need to have a bigger megaphone talking about the problems that we discussed a little bit over the last couple hours about the problem of not just utility patents, but other restrictive forms of IPR. Just licenses alone can be as restrictive, um, if not more, as patents, because licenses, contract law doesn't expire, <laughs> and so as and patents do. And so there, there's some troubling trends in that regard. But OSI serves as, as a way for at least growers and breeders to communicate to their customers and other researchers, other farmers, that our intent is for this to remain open and shared. Um, and there are ways, I do want to point out that there are ways to use existing IPR models in a way that adheres to open source principles. So, um, for example, the Who Gets Kiss Sweet Corn example that I provided that we were a partner in, that was licensed to a seed company, but only so that a small percentage of the seed sales comes back to the organic plant breeding project so that those resources can further, can advance another variety. There are no restrictions associated with that licensing agreement. All the customers can save that seed. In fact, when we released Who Gets Kissed, we also released a plant breeding guide for growers that said, this is how you improve sweet corn in, on your farm or in your garden. These are, these are on-farm organic plant breeding practices because we want, we want growers to be saving and improving upon these genetics. So there, again, there is a way to adhere to open source principles and values um, using traditional IPR tools, in my opinion. Um, if you're not saving seeds, it seems like the most important thing you can do is to be buying seeds from those producers that are gonna, that want you to keep it open source. And um, you know, if yeah. that's all you do, you're, you're still helping the system. Yeah, that align with your values. I know we we triple vine and probably Robin and it you could see, you know, it's not it's not a get rich quick scheme. Mm -hmm. <laughs> see, it's, <laughs> it's just a devotion. Yeah. It should be easier in the economy that we have that they are valued and so that you can do your work um, in a better way. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing, you know, production of something then then you know you hopefully it's understood that you know, this seed is really small, so when you tell me you want to pay me twenty dollars for a pound of it, that's not very much, you know. But on the other hand, this seed um, doesn't take a lot of seed to make a lot of packets. To, it goes pretty far. And I, I think one thing that worries me with seed a little bit is there is a lot of waste in seed. There's, yes. There's a lot of seed that goes unplanted. There's a lot of people with ancient seed packets somewhere in a warm room in the back of the house, you know, in a shoebox, and then you put it in a cool room, that would be great because it would be lasting longer. But I want to, I, I hate to produce seed and not have it be utilized. Like that's really hard to do. Yeah. And so this venue, I think people, when people, do you think when people are picking up seeds here, they're using them? I don't know the answer to that question, but it's yeah. a concern. You can do a little survey maybe next year. Yeah. We what we're doing this year, we're hoping to see we will do a lot of advertising about it, but we got these little stickers that say uh, grown from free the seeds. Yeah. And our hope is to kind of do we have like we're having a photo contest throughout the summer. Oh cool. Where we wanna get pictures of people of what they've grown from free the seeds. It's our hope. So we'll have to really try and get the word out as much as possible. Um, but our, our hope is to get, to start getting some evidence on what people are doing with seeds from Free the Seeds. Um, and you know, it, it was pretty cool. I went to the, you know, we have seed boxes at all the libraries throughout the whole valley, including Eureka, to um, bring seed for the event. And the last, I picked up Cowl Spells and there was a huge bag of spinach seeds that was from last year's Free the Seeds. Oh my God! From free seeds, and oh, that, no. and it was this big. Grown from it. Yeah, mm. and it, it was really exciting. You know, that's, that's like cool. that's the, Which and that's what we're gonna. I think we'll start to see that's more beautiful. as we put some, as we put every year. We're putting more focus on like we need you all to grow and donate 
to be a part of this because it's not it's not any one person's responsibility. It's not Judy's and um, Robin's responsibility to grow all the seeds for you know the valley. It's important that we're all part of the process in some way. And it's not difficult. Yeah. You know, like you can all do this. You can. If you pick one or two that you like, plants that you like, and mm -hmm. then you're going to be really loving picking the traits that you want. You're going to, it's just so immensely gratifying to do it at that level. Well, and yeah, and that's super exciting to see that huge bag of Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, Did you, you get a picture? picture? Oh. <laughs> uh, well, I. We got it just at the end, so it, it wasn't packaged. It'll be packaged for next year. Oh, so okay. we, I can definitely take pictures. And then we also got a jar um, with the Baker Creek um, label in it of squash seeds. That was from last year, too. Um, so that was just kind of exciting. Yeah. And, it's, you know, it's just mm -hmm. fun to see that happening. Yeah. And it's going to happen more and more as we keep doing this. And we, you know, we keep stressing downstairs the importance of saving, you know, of people participating um, so that, you know, we, we can get more community involvement because we have the potential to create, you know, Flathead Valley locally adapted seeds that we, you know, use here. I mean, you keep talking about, you know, developing a couple of varieties that are known for, from the Flathead Valley. Yeah. You know, and, they used um, to be the way it was at times, yeah. Well, it's not there anymore. Not there anymore. Oh, they used to be there. Okay. It used to be there, and it, and it was, they grew um, kind of ridiculous, I think it was, that in the old days they would ship it on the train to New York City with ice packed from Whitefish Lake, where it had been packed in sawdust from some town, and they went to New York City and from there oh, on. they were on deep. And that, uh, right, Belgium. Yeah, Belgian on deep. And they went from there to Paris, France. Oh, wow. Radicchio? Uh, Belgian Belgian. Okay. Oh, it's got oh, and nice. Okay. Yeah, and Flathead Valley used to have a food packing. Yep. Right with Mall is now. It was known as the Cherry Warehouse, but it also packed peas and beans. And we could coordinate growers, they were made to coordinate growers to have a packing, you know, with one grower to, to have a you know, candy warehouse. Maybe we'll get no, back there. All. <laughs> <laughs> That's almost empty, so maybe we need to sell yeah. it to the new There you go, the building's house. solid, right? Shopco's leaving. Oh, I'm talking Kalispell. Oh, the Kalispell Center Mall? Uh -huh. Yeah. That was because it's on the tracks. Yeah, so it was the packing mall. Oh, yeah. And I just learned from our last North Valley Ag that we used to have 15 or 18 dairies in the valley. 40. Okay. And then you know how many gun manufacturers we have in the valley? Or gun parts. And, and uh, they used to process it back when they opened, which is in the set of eighties. Said they used to uh, they used to distribute two thousand chicks every week. Yeah. Because there were that many people, you know, processing chickens because of all the small farms. Uh, According to CHS, we now have 13 full-time farmers, families that make their sole income from farming in the county. What's CHS? Uh, Senex. Senex Harvest States oh. Farm Supply. 13? Yeah. For this was a meeting that was at about five years ago. Because I'd say today that it's, maybe it's 20. There's it's looking at people whose income doesn't know that there's not a partner, family partner member that has an outside income. The family is totally from farming. It's kind of sad. It's very sad. It's definitely a national trend. Sorry. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no. but it's rising. That's right. We had a great <laughs> farmers collective meeting the other night. Thank you, Beth. Oh, thank you. Collective maybe not the right word, but we had a farmers gathering. Mm -hmm. And there was like 20 of us in there, professional farmers. Yeah. Some of them were couples, but still. Yeah. It was totally of us in there. Well, at, um, Farm Hands does um, food access groups at Columbia Falls, Whitefish, and Powellsville. And we, last 2017, we had 55 different um, farmers that we worked with um, in our food access programs. And last year it was 75. Oh, wow. Nice. That's and great. there's probably, 10 that are bakeries out of that group so that would be 65 farmers and that's meat 
eggs and vegetables, but majority vegetables. And, I, and I'm sure not all of them solely make their money from agriculture. But, was probably here. <laughs> but it's still, it was just a kind of a cool you know, number to, you know, to have. Anyway. And we can do that with seed. Yep. We can grow our seed growers. You know, we can. Triple Divide is looking for growers that want to be part of the Triple Divide and grow for them. You know, we're always looking for more growers. Yeah, even like you said, a couple of varieties make a difference. Yeah. You start somewhere. Yeah. Especially if they're really good varieties. And then if they're, if, if they're important varieties, and yeah. then just don't get overwhelmed. Yeah. You know, just. Got it, bro. Got it. Don't get overwhelmed. <laughs> Thank you.